single piece that uh, use compliance to hold their name tag on. Okay, so but there are some limitations to compliant mechanisms, um, meaning disadvantages. But I, I hesitate to call them disadvantages because they're very overcomable. So I prefer calling them limitations uh, or challenges. Okay, so the first challenge is they're dif more difficult to design and analyze. That's what I told you about before, with axiomatic design and the principle of keep it simple, stupid, and and the and you know things that are coupled versus independent. Um, and, and, and just non-linearities, and, and it's just uh, it's a nightmare uh, designing and analyzing compliance systems, or at least it traditionally was, which is why humans hadn't done it for a very long time. Well, this is overcomable. Thank heavens that's why there's professors like me that create design analysis approaches to make this much more uh, approachable. Okay, so it's, very, it's overcomable, and my job proves it, right? That's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, <laughs> okay? So that's, but that's one disadvantage, okay? The second disadvantage is sometimes maybe you don't want energy stored, right? Sometimes when you deform something or when you move something relative to something else, uh, you, you don't want it to store energy and like snap back, right? Well, there's ways around this as well. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, by stable mechanisms, you can deform them to, or multi-stable mechanisms, more than just two stable states, you can deform them to many different stable states. And even though they technically store strain energy, you don't know it because it remains deformed in place. So if you ever want to move something and have it not snap back, that's totally doable with a compliant mechanism using multi-stability. Um, you know, there's also other ways, you know, if you plastically deform something, then it, you know, there will be some spring back, but it'll remain deformed and it won't be storing uh, any strain energy as it remains deformed. Um, so, so anyway, there, there's ways to get around it um, if you don't want it and still use a compliant mechanism. There's, there's many others. So, you know, watch my YouTube channel. Okay, so um, fatigue, that's another issue. Um, you know, you might say like, okay, well, you know, this guy can rotate back and forth, but how many cycles before it breaks? Because, um, you know, does this ever fatigue and break? That's something that uh, rigid mechanisms don't have to deal with. Well, uh, this, is, this is not a problem for compliance. I mean, it, it's definitely something you need to consider, and it's, it's a limitation because fatigue is real. Um, but if you select your material and you do it wisely so that it has an infinite fatigue life capability um, and you um, design it right so that for the deformation you want to achieve um, in any given cycle it never surpasses its fatigue limit the, the fatigue limit of the material, the stress in it never surpasses the fatigue limit of the material then you can design it so that it's not a problem, it won't ever break well and you know saying it won't ever break or infinite fatigue life, those are all very uh, suspect words in engineering. It's never true, but you know, way, way longer than any human life, right? Um, uh, in theory, uh, if you never surpass a material's uh, you know, s certain stress limit, there are some materials that can last forever. Now, there, there are some materials that don't ever, they don't have a limit, no matter how much stress they experience, um, if they experience it enough times, even if it's just a tiny little bit, it will eventually break. You want to, if you care about it, you want to stay away from those materials unless you do the calculation and there's so many cycles for the low stress you're using that, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to last like three lifetimes or something, right? Like, you know, so, but, you know, it's something you need to take into consideration. You need to understand fatigue theory. It's not something I'm going to cover too much in this class. Um, but, um, and I will talk about it in my YouTube channel, but, um, it's very overcomable. You, you can make fatigue not an issue for any mechanism you want to make that's compliant. Okay, the other limitation is uh, it has limited range. You know, um, most bearing, most other bearings, slider, roller bearings, they can just, you know, like a train is basically a slider bearing. That train can just go forever. It can drive all the way from New York to Los Angeles, you know, um, and it just keeps going. Or, or a roller bearing, they, they can just continuously 360 degrees of rotation. Whereas compliant mechanisms like this one, you can't just keep rotating this. There's a certain point where it will yield and, and break. And that, that point, by the way, as a rule of thumb, ends up being around 10% of the size of the flexures. So, you know, you can deform this about 10% of the size of these flexures 
Um, but, you know, you, you wouldn't, and that's just a very rough rule of thumb. You want to consider the design and the material and make sure you stay away from whatever the, will, the range that will cause it to yield. But, um, yeah, Larry Howell, when he, I mean, he reported this as one of the downsides, and he said, you know, there's no uh, getting over this. Uh, you know, compliant mechanisms, their biggest disadvantage is they're, they're limited in range. Okay, but then someone showed him actually, no, there is a way to overcome this. First of all, there are many ways to in improve the range. You can stack things in series and nest them inside of each other so it takes up the same size, but it gets double the range. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of things you can do to increase range. Like you could, you know, make things much more uh, compliant. Um, you make those blades much thinner, so for the same force you can deform it much further without it yielding. There's all kinds of things you can do to improve the range. But uh, what Larry said was, well, but there's no way to get infinite range. And then someone kind of proved him wrong, um, but kind of. Okay, so here's, here's how. Um, this is actually a compliant mechanism. It's an origami piece that is essentially, it, it's called a hexaflexagon. And it's made of these different uh, tetrahedron kind of shapes. Here, I'll play it again. And they essentially um, deform at these creases. And they deform back and forth over a large range. Again, it's not infinite range at each local crease. It still deforms back and forth over a finite range. But the entire mechanism can just keep rotating through itself forever. Okay, so you could just keep rotating this continuously forever and uh, achieve infinite range, so to say. There is a trick to that. If you, if you ground one of the bodies, uh, you know, you, you can't keep it rotating without changing the ground. Um, you know, it'll run into the ground. So it's still a problem. But, but this, is, this is one way to approach, to think about, well, maybe you could get infinite range. Okay. So those are compliant mechanisms. Now I want to talk about um, and the, the advantages and disadvantages of compliant mechanisms. Okay, now I want to talk about um, the uh, um, flexures, precision flexures. Okay, they are a type of compliant mechanism. Okay, so Stuart Smith is the guy who wrote the textbook on flexures. And he defined flexures, a flexure is usually considered to be a mechanism consisting of a series of rigid bodies connected by compliant elements that is designed to produce a geometrically well-defined motion upon application of force. Okay, so, so, so again, it consists of rigid bodies, so these two big rigid Chinese looking stars here, okay, that are connected together by flexible elements like these blades that can deform, okay, um, and they, they, they're arranged so that they upon application force guide this in this instance to just rotate. So this is a flexure mechanism, okay? Now these out here, so every flexure is a compliant mechanism. It's a type of compliant mechanism because it uses deformation to achieve an interesting task, right? Um, but uh, but they, they're specific. So you put the Venn diagram inside the compliant mechanism. You wouldn't consider these things, you know, the CD case, these nail clippers, this clamp, or this uh, chainsaw clutch, to be a flexure. Um, I, but, but again, to be clear, these definitions are a little hand wavy, and people disagree, and not everyone's going to classify something that deforms uh, all the same. Some people would consider certain flexures compliant mechanisms, some compliant things, um, uh, you know, vice versa. They, they wouldn't consider it flexures. Um, you know, so 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 it's it's a little hand wavy, but you know, if you understand what a flexure is, this is a clear example of a flexure. Rigid bodies joined by flexible elements that guide motions. Okay, so and by the way, anyway, I'll have a whole discussion about what a compliant mechanism even is in my YouTube channel. So um, you'll see that uh, at some point. Okay, so. Um, there are three kinds of flexure systems, okay? There are parallel, serial, and hybrid, and they're classified according to how they're configured, right? So um, a parallel system consists of just two rigid bodies, okay, a stage in S or in ground, which is held fixed, okay, connected directly together by parallel elements, or just, let's say, flex, you know, uh, flexure elements, things that flex and bend, okay? Um, the schematic, it depicts bodies as rectangles and uh, flexure elements as just springs, 
the zigzag spring. Okay? In this example, the state, these do look like rectangles, but these springs are the blade flexures. Okay? So that's a parallel system. Two bodies directly connected by springs. Okay? In a parallel fashion there. Okay? Serial flexure systems are multiple parallel systems stacked or nested in series. Here you have one parallel system, here you have a second parallel system stacked in, in like a serial chain. And in this case, there, yes, it's still serial, it's just nested back on itself. Here's the ground to an intermediate body, that's the I, to the stage, goes back to S, okay? Um, so you can see this is serially stacked, this is nested, but also serially stacked, okay? And they'd have the, the, this is the correct diagram for this, okay? Okay, and I'll, we'll be talking about how to draw diagrams in, in future episodes here, but, um, or future lectures, but um, this, uh, hybrid systems are basically, I mean, it's kind of a throwaway category, it's anything that's not parallel or serial is a hybrid system, okay? And you, you think of it as like that because everything that's not parallel and serial is some kind of combination of parallel or serial elements. So you can see here, here's a, here's a bunch of parallel modules in a serial limb here, and these are two serial limbs in parallel, okay? So it's a combination of parallel and serial things, and you can see here is this guy, okay? So those are the three categories of flexure systems. How you define them is going to be critical to this course, and so, of course, I'm going to talk about this in a lot of detail later. You don't need to get this right now, other than there's just three categories, okay? Now, there's also three types of elements. So, you know, the systems consist of rigid bodies, these rectangles connected together by elements, the springs. There's many different kinds of springs in reality. There's wire flexures, there's blade flexures, you've seen those a lot, and then there's living hinges, okay? And schematically, they're all represented by this zigzag spring, okay? And so there's, there's three kinds of elements as well. There's parallel elements, serial elements, and hybrid elements I'll talk to you about. So there's the three categories of systems and the three categories of elements. And you can see here, uh, here's a parallel system, serial system, hybrid system, and they're using three different elements. All those elements, by the way, happen to be parallel elements, though. So, but, you know, that's going to really confuse you. So, wait till a future lecture when we'll really get into this, because it, it matters a lot to design. Okay? So, I want you to think of flexures as an alternative to bearings. Okay? What is a bearing? A bearing is something that constrains some motion, some body to not move in certain unwanted directions while allowing it to move in wanted directions. So for instance, this is a ball bearing. Okay, this shaft is intended only to rotate and indeed it can rotate freely with no, almost no resistance, right? Um, and it's much, much orders of magnitude way stiffer in all other directions. It constrains it. Okay, this is a slider and rotating bearing here. This can this is stiff in all directions, but it can freely translate and rotate. Okay, they can both translate and rotate. But together, if you, put, if you were to put a, a block and join these together, and have these two uh, parallel guide, then you kill the rotation, it can only translate. So it, it locks it so that uh, it's stiff in all directions, but uh, you know, basically un, free to move with the translation. Okay, so in like manner, Flexures are a bearing. So you can see here's the flexure example. This stage up here and this stage up here, th those bodies, sorry, those bodies are ground, they're held fixed. These are intermediate stages and this is, or intermediate bodies and this is the stage, the final thing you care about, okay? This is designed so that the flexures make it very stiff in all directions, the stage, but allow it to deform along the x-direction with much higher compliance. There's still a resisting force, of course. It's just orders of magnitude less than in all the other directions, okay? So it's correctly called flexure bearing. Uh, allows motion with high compliance in certain directions, but stiffens it, or, or restricts it with high stiffness in other constrained directions. Okay? So there are a uh, single degree of freedom flexure bearings. These are some famous examples. This is a very famous flexure cross pivot. Uh, allows a rotation, huge rotation, and it's, it remains stiff and stable over its entire range of deformation. Um, so it's a great rotary joint. Okay, This is a parallel guide mechanism that achieves just a single translation. And they, these are other famous flexures that just achieve rotation. And notice they're just one degree of freedom. But flexures can also achieve multiple degrees of freedom. Okay, 
These are examples. This weird flexure achieves tip and tilt. Okay, it can two degrees of freedom. This flexure achieves three degrees of freedom. It can rotate around X, rotate around Y, and translate in Z. Okay, and, but then it's stiff in all the other directions. So flexure bearings are far more interesting than traditional bearings uh, because they can achieve many more combinations of degrees of freedom that are much more interesting and versatile. Uh, and uh, anything from zero degrees of freedom to, you know, six degrees of freedom. So every combination degree of freedom you can imagine flexures can achieve, whereas rigid bearings are, are dramatically limited in the combination of motions they can achieve. Okay? And I'll show that in this class very uh, strongly. Okay? And it makes sense. You can deform in all kinds of weird directions, right? Okay. Um, okay, flexure applications and importance. Okay? Um, you'll often use flexures, precision flexures, when you need to move tiny, tiny motions very accurately and precisely, okay? Um, and so like for instance, microscopy stages, anytime you're looking at tiny like cells or smaller or even atoms and you need to move it under some kind of microscope objective, uh, you know, flexure bearings are a great option because uh, they can move things tiny little amounts and be very repeatable. Okay, so these are, these are some, uh, there's a famous company, Physique Instrument, that sells all sorts of flexure stages, and you can see all the flexures embedded uh, in here. Um, you know, look at your copy of the slide if you can't see it on the video. Okay, and in this design, there's these uh, four bent blade flexures at its corner that gets these, uh, that gets these motions. Okay. The other time you want to use flexures is if you're controlling light. So say, you have optical mounts. This is a, actually an ancient CD player. Uh, the, the laser comes through to read the disc um, and, through this lens, and this lens is guided and steered by flexure bearings. So anytime you're moving mirrors or optical lenses or anything, you're, you're dealing with light, you need generally very small but precise and accurate uh, motions to position things and flexure bearings are, are the way to go, okay? And you'll understand this in, in a little bit why. Um, telescopes, any, you know, again, you, you want to use uh, flexures to uh, control stuff dealing with light, okay? Flexure bearings are also one of the only bearing sets on a tiny scale. These are little MEMS devices, little tiny devices. This is, um, uh, you know, th there's, there's a similar device to this in the projector that is making this presentation. You know, I'm projecting my slides from my computer through a projector onto this screen. And uh, if you look into that, these little DLP chips where they have just, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of these um, tiny little, uh, you know, around 16 to 20 micron size mirrors that can, uh, that can tip back and forth. And, and do so very precisely and very rapidly because they have such little inertia. They can be accelerated back and forth very quickly. And, uh, you know, there's a spinning color wheel that, that flashes, you know, the different uh, colors of, you know, the, you know the, the, the primary colors to make any color on the screen. And, uh, and through those, those colors, when the, when the mirror is either tipped in a direction where it throws the light away, it's basically a pixel that's off. And when it's facing the screen, then it's a pixel that's on. And you flash these colors, um, you know, very rapidly, uh, you know, red, red, green, and blue. And, uh, um, and, and, and you can basically paint the image that's projected on the screen with these little MEMS mirrors. This technology would not be remotely possible without uh, flexure bearings because it's, it's very difficult, to, like I said, to make things on small scales, okay, that are any other bearing option than, than flexures. Uh, from fabrication standpoint and assembly standpoint, it starts getting very difficult to fabricate and assemble things on tiny scales. And, of course, they have, um, uh, you know, stick, you know, all sorts of adhesive issues on small scales that, that bind things when, when the surface forces uh, and intramolecular forces dominate the inertial forces. And so, so you know, if, if you want to create relative motion on a small scale, uh, on a micro machine or smaller, uh, you're probably going to be best using flexures. Okay, so this is what I said. It's really the only solution for providing complex motions at submicron scales. 
Okay, they can perform with sub nanometer resolution and repeatability. So what you know, what is resolution? It's like, well, think about it. What what is the smallest amount you can take your finger and put it on a table? What do you think is the smallest amount you can move that repeatably? Um, it's it's actually a giant amount. You know, it's something like sub millimeter. Um, you know, but uh, uh, you know, flexures uh, with the right actuator, you can move picometers even, much smaller amounts, uh, you know, reliably. So that's what resolution is. And then ha repeatably, that, that's precision. And we're going we're to talk about that in a little bit. But how much can you do something over and over again, okay? Um, well, as far as resolution and repeatability and precision, flexures are just king. They're, they're amazing, okay? Some of the best precision technologies that exist, and certainly for the lowest cost. Okay, so they're they're you know, like I said, the competitors for flexures is magnetic or air bearings, and the reason is you know, you you want to get rid of uh, friction at all costs. That kills repeatability, right? Um, anytime you've got two bodies that are sliding past each other, generating friction. Um, the surface, as you slide it back and forth, is going to change as it as it breaks itself on tiny scales, and so it generates all this heat and something called hysteresis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it makes it so that it's not repeatable; it doesn't do the same thing every time. So friction is very bad for repeatability. Okay, so you know, magnetic and air bearings they levitate two bodies and can still guide relative motions with, uh, you know, constrain certain directions while allowing other directions with, with uh, basically no resistance. And so they achieve great precision because they don't have their friction, um, but, you know, on the same level as flexures, but um, flexures uh, achieve, like I said, the same precision, but for way less complexity. Like you can imagine all the piping, tubing, sealant, and everything with air bearings and all the coils and magnets and all the stuff for magnetic air bearings and all the control that goes into that. You know, my professor um, at MIT, you know, his student was Chris DiBiasio, helped him make what's called a hex flex, um, which was, you know, the holy grail of precision flexures was to make a six axis position or something that can move with three rotations and three independent translations, right? Um, and, 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 and with very high precision and accuracy. And so, yeah, there's magnetic and air bearing solutions um, in these multi-million dollar machines. Um, but he said, well, hey, let's like spend a couple hundred bucks and use a wire EDM and, and it could be, you know, even, even cheaper. This is, a, this is a fairly small machine. Just cut out a planar sheet um, uh, of flexures, essentially. And uh, using magnetic actuators, you know, he attached magnets onto these tabs and using coils below it, he could actuate this in six degrees of freedom. So the bearing solution was just super cheap and put all these companies um, out of business. You know, it went from a multi-million dollar thing to a couple hundred bucks. It does the same thing and better. And it's easier to maintain. There's less parts. And of course, it's lighter weight, fits in the palm of your hand as opposed to taking up a, a room, right? So... So flexures are a good way to go if you want uh, precision and repeatability. Resolution, much cheaper, okay? So let's, let's in case you, you know, I've talked a little bit about precision and repeatability, um, and I've mentioned accuracy, but let's really define what these things are, okay? Because uh, it, it's very important. So imagine you have this cantilever, and you, it's basically a flexure, okay? A flexure blade, it's like a beam, right? And you have a force and you're pushing on it and you're trying to push on it in the same way every time. Well, nothing is the same every time in an imperfect world, right? So say, you're, say you're going for this intended spot. Once you push on it, you want this to deform and you want the bottom edge of this to reach this intended spot. But it actually only hits there. And, and, and in truth, every time you push on it, no matter how much you try and get the same spot over and over, it's gonna, the actual spot's going to move around. Okay, and if you if you um, if you plot like a, a bar graph kind of, of all the spots it actually you know achieves, you get this kind of Gaussian distribution of spots. Okay, where the mean is essentially the average spot you're pushing it to, and the the spread you know, it can be tracked by the standard deviation. That's that's a measure of how much how tight that bell curve is and, or how spread out it is, okay? 
So say your intended target was like here, okay? But your bell curve looked like this. So, so, so say you kept pushing this over and over again, and you kept getting all these weird actual points, and your intended was right there, and uh, you plot all the actual points, and you take the average of them. Accuracy is the difference between the intended and the mean of the actual. That's accuracy. That's how far off that is. Precision is basically captured by the standard deviation. How, how, you know, is this a tight curve or is this spread out? If it's spread out, it's not precise. If it's a tight curve, then it's very repeatable. Standard deviation is small and it's high precision, okay? So, let's see here. Um, flexures, the, you know, so, so by the way, you can get precision and, and resolution uh, nanometers easily Picometers is even possible, which is basically the forefront of what's achievable with, in the precision world. Picometers is very small resolution repeatability with, with flexures. If you design them right, there's all sorts of principles you have to get in there to get it that, that nice. Okay? But they're not, so they're amazing with resolution and precision, but they're not accurate. Okay? But that's no problem, you can calibrate it. Okay, but what is that, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute. So that statement will be clear um, on the, the next slide, okay? So I just wanted you to know that you try and do something over and over again. The average of the actual, the distance between that, or the mean and the intended is the accuracy, and the standard deviation is a measure of the, the spread or the precision, okay? Okay, so the easiest way to think about this is uh, an archer trying to hit a target, okay? Okay, so say, you know, of course this is the best. This is both accurate and precise. It's precise in that the clump of, say they shoot the arrow many, many times, and all the arrow spots are right there, okay? Well, that, that's got a pretty small spread, so that's very precise, and it's accurate, okay? That would be the dream. You'd want a machine that was good at, was that, right? Well, this is a machine that's still precise. They're all clumped together, but it's inaccurate. It's pretty far away. The mean here is very far away from the intended. Whereas here, this is imprecise. They're all spread out in a pretty bad way. Standard deviation would be pretty large, but the mean is almost dead on to the intended target. In this case, this is just hopeless. This is bad precision and bad accuracy, okay? So um, if I told you, say I, wanted, I, I gave you a technology and you could either choose to be imprecise and accurate or accurate or inaccurate and precise. So if you had to be here or here, which one would you be? Well, hopefully you'd be this, okay? Because if an archer is like this, there's no way to fix this. You can't fix, you know, just not talented, okay? You can't, you can't account for bad talent, okay? So, um, you know, if, if a machine was just imprecise and the spread was off, you're not going to do what you want to do very often, okay? And so, and there's not much you can do to fix that other than scrap the technology and make it more precise, right? Flexures are this one, okay? They, they are very repeatable, very tight spread, and, but it's, it's almost impossible to get them to be right as they intend once you make it. But that's no problem. Just like the archer, you can just tell the archer, hey, you know, start aiming, like, stop aiming where you think, you, you know, instead of aiming here, why don't you aim down here because you're consistently moving up there and then maybe you'll actually get the target. So, you know, you can calibrate the archer. Like, if, as long as they're really skilled and precise, repeatable every time, you can just tell them to, oh, why don't you just start aiming in a different place? You know, pretend the center of the target's down here and that, that'll work, okay? And that's what you do with flexures, okay? You build it, it's never the accuracy you want, but then you just calibrate it and it can still be super accurate and precise and eventually you can get flexures to there, okay? Okay, so let's understand why are flexures precise, okay? Well, um, okay, it's a, it's a good question. Well, when you achieve relative motion between bodies in a compliant system or a flexure, right, um, the way you're achieving the relative motion is by stretching or compressing the atoms that, that the material makes up in the element, right? So, so these little gray dots are, you know, signify atoms. And, and here we're, we're stretching and then letting it go. And you can see the atomic bonds stretch and release, okay? As long as you don't 
break any of those atomic bonds and release energy, which, which essentially creates internal friction, and, and you just stretch the atomic bonds and let them go and they spring back, they're very repeatable. They will, 